This is a story of human rights becoming meaningful in South Africa. Not in the constitutional court as one would expect, but among isolated rural residents living on the Ponderland wild coast, who have just reached a major milestone in their long walk to economic freedom. I cannot imagine it. You know, you see all these mountains, you know the beauty, so once you dug it open, then all of this is going to be destroyed. The breathtaking scenery of Ponderland in eastern South Africa could change forever. An Australian company, Mineral Resource Commodities, wants to mine the dunes for titanium sands. So, so where were you? And Amzamo feels that the area is just too special to become a mining site. I tell what the miners don't tell, the, the impact of it in the community. Mining will transplant people and alter the landscape and the Pondos are fighting to save their way of life. It is along this coastline that a mining company wishes to dig up 360 million tons of material. With global commodity prices rising and resources dwindling, it is here in Africa that the battleground is drawn. They have, at least for now, convinced the Minister of Mineral Resources, Susan Shabangu, to cancel mining rights for the Tolobeni Mineral Sands project on the Ponderland Wild Coast. I get the sense that history is being made here on the Eastern Cape Wild Coast. We're moving beyond the academic analysis paralysis and the political blame game and seeing a historically disadvantaged rural community taking their destiny into their own hands simply by invoking their constitutional rights. John, bring us up to date as to where the Tolobeni mining and the toll road venture stand. Well, as far as the mining is concerned, the community regard it as history and they're planning for an ecotourism future without it. The minister did allow the mining company 90 days to pull the fat out the fire. We have not been copied on any correspondence to indicate whether they've actually met, met any requirements there. So we're working on the assumption that they are lapsed and that uh, we can start planning for what really should have been happening 10 years ago. But what about the toll road? Is, is this not a setback? Well, six years ago, if Minister van Skalkberg had actually rejected the appeals against the first proposal, it would have been a huge setback. Because at that stage, the, the fight was very much about environmentalists from outside, concerned about the endeme endemic plants. But given the mining experience over the last five years, we've seen a community that's really empowered themselves by accessing their constitutional rights, freedom of expression, access to information. And I wouldn't like to be on the other side, I promise you. So I don't know what they're saying. Our government, I trust even now, will come to us when they come up with a recommendation. There will be no resolution that will be taken by our government without considering our views. That was what Zamila Kunya said back in 2003. But it has now emerged that he and attorney Maxwell Bukwana had already established Zolko as a BEE entity to share in the mining profits. Soon after that interview, he and his brother Bashin were to be handsomely compensated by MRC to promote the mining venture. 5050, who have been challenging coastal dune mining since 1988, when Richards Bay Minerals applied for mining rights in the Great St. Lucia Nature Reserve, was quick to get to the heart of the challenge. With an issue as controversial as this, it, it, it really surprises me that no NGO or capacity building organisation has actually come into this area and said, what are the issues that we're looking at? We're looking at mining, we're looking at the road, we're looking at, at ecotourism, and said, let's look at the pros and cons of all of them. Let's, let's give you the information that you as a community need so that you can make an informed decision. It seems the debate is happening up here and the people on the ground are actually being alienated, marginalized, and aren't really part of this decision-making process. That's a problem. The Royal House of Amon Pondo with Her Majesty Queen Lombokiso Masubuza Zikao leading the challenge,
were the first to challenge the government and show that even the cabinet ministers were sharpened at odds with each other. Well, press has been kicked out. There are so many things that happen on the ground that we don't get to know about. No, they, they locked the, the door and closed the door. We're not allowed into that meeting, but what's even worse is that some of the people that the Pando Queen has invited on her behalf have also been asked to leave the room, and this is people like Cathy Kay from the Wildlife and Environment Society, political parties um, such as the Independent Democrats and the DA. All right, so apparently the Queen has got them to move and the meeting is now open. Our delegation uh, today consisted of uh, a number of senior ministers from national... I ask, would the mining be feasible if that road does not take the current proposed route? But we cannot answer that question. That's a question that a private company that's interested in mining must answer. And would you have the power to veto a mining decision from any other department? It is one area that is still with the Minister of Mineral and Energy Affairs and not with the Department of the Environment. We passed a law in 2002 which stipulates that uh, before you start any mining operations you have to consult with the local people. That includes the Royal House. We feel we have not consulted enough and it is now that we are going to have a very strong consultation around these issues. Zamila Kunya had in the meantime entrenched himself and his younger brother, Bashim, as gatekeepers to the community. They were paid by MRC to co-opt the community into supporting the mining proposal. But some deeply concerned community leaders alleged it was more than mere co-option. Kunya and his supporters were confronted at the regular weekly in Bizo, a public meeting held under the jurisdiction of the local traditional leaders, or Indunas. Remember she said that if human rights are to matter at all, they must matter in small places close to home, so small that you cannot find them on any maps of the world. But they are the world of the individual worker in his factory, in his farm, etc. And she said that the way in which this would be done would be by concerted citizen action, by people holding their governments accountable. <laughs> Unfortunately, neither Caruso, Cunha, John Barnes or the lawyer for the BE partner in the deal, Zolko, Max Bukwana, showed up at the follow-up meeting. The situation was trembling on the edge of conflict, with the more militant arguing that the time had come for them to take the law into their own hands, recalling the Pondo Revolt of 1960. But thanks to the timely intervention of respected human rights lawyer and Diswe Ndoni, a better strategy was developed. She advised the angry residents not to allow themselves to be provoked into breaking the law, as this would lead to the police arresting them which would play straight into the hands of the Cunha brothers. A representative structure known as the Amadiba Crisis Committee was formed and embarked on a program of action to report human rights violations to all the relevant authorities. 
including the Pondo Royal House, the South African Human Rights Commission, and the Department of Mineral Resources. John Clark, a social worker, was contracted by the Crisis Committee to assist them in claiming their constitutional rights. In South Africa, after 15 years, that this, the freedom that we struggled for, is actually being put seriously at risk by what I perceive to be people with large vested interests who simply do not care. My role was really to enable a rural disadvantaged community to actualize their constitutional rights. The king decided the situation merited a royal visit, an intervention reserved for only the most serious situations. A high-level delegation from the Human Rights Commission also came to monitor the meeting. Growing media attention gave the Amadiba Crisis Committee what they needed to put pressure on MRC and Zolko to account for their behaviour. And on the Minister of Minerals and Energy to explain the government's position. The Human Rights Commission intervention rocked MRC and severely embarrassed the government. To someone materially involved in this, watching the situation, involved in it, uh, social worker John Clark, good evening to you and welcome. You've been quoted as saying that the Minerals and Energy Department is acting suspiciously. In what way? I mean, they talk of this mining as being there to uplift the people, but the mining company has basically been going around bribing the chiefs with liquor, uh, turning, splitting families, causing division and creating what was once a peaceful community and a haven for eco-tourists and really brought economic benefit, but that mining company has sabotaged the existing eco-tourism and is actually causing a major conflict within the community, which I worry is going to be another Pondo revolt that happened 50 years ago. But look at what is happening today. The, the Madiba Adventures uh, project did get to win that international prize. And so you can imagine, uh, where would we be today if we hadn't been disturbed by the, the, the mining projects, the, 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 the prospecting, and, and, and all that has been happening concerning the mining issue. Things came to a head in July 2008, when the community took to the beaches in protest action. I've got livestock. I've got kids. I, I cultivate the soil. I rather die than allow this land to be mined. Pilots from the battlers joined the local residents to fly an aerial support mission in solidarity, with South Coast residents joining their neighbours from the Wild Coast in a spectacular show of concerted citizen action. But MRC were unrepentant. The crisis committee raised their media profile higher still. To mount his own protest, Mark Caruso, the Australian CEO of MRC, called me, presumably concerned about the declining fortunes of his mining company on the Australian Stock Exchange as a consequence of all the bad press. Gun do something tangible, mate. Down Australia, peace will get off the park, is what we say, and mm. you can quote that. The government says, and most notably its uh, mineral and energy spokesperson Becky Kamalo says, Mineral Commodities, the company, is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, therefore it could be relied to act upon as a responsible corporate citizen. I suspect you're not buying that, are you? Well, I mean, it's, it's a venture capital outfit on the Australian Stock Exchange. Australia has much more liberal rules, I've is, is discovered, than the South African Stock Exchange to raise capital for high-risk ventures than we would allow in South Africa, and that's really what they've been doing. We found that if we started investigating and saw, looked at their website and looked at the Australian Stock Exchange rules, that these guys were, were really lying to their own shareholders. Is this a fait accompli? Uh, or no, you're you, you, you well, fighting a losing battle here. Well, I mean, thankfully, we have the constitution. We look at what's happening in Zimbabwe and other places. South Africa is different. We have constitution. There's a fundamental human rights at stake here. The Human Rights Commission are furious as well, I believe. 
because they have basically been snubbed by the D Department of Energy. I initiated a human rights inquiry in that and called them in to investigate you know, last year already, and the Human Rights Commission has been very worried because DME and the Department of Environmental Affairs and Land Affairs are clearly not singing off the same song sheet. All right, sheet. the Mineral and Energy Minister is going to the region on Friday. What mm. do you want her to say to the community? Well, I would like her to take the Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism with her and the Minister of Land Affairs with her so that the community can see that government is being accountable to exercise cooperative decision-making. At the moment, that is not the case, and the suspicions are rife that there's a particular vested interest behind the Department of Energy. August 2008. Minister Sanjika arrives at Tolobeni High School to try to convince local residents to accept the government's decision to award the mining license to MRC and Zolko. Patrick Caruso, the younger brother of Mark Caruso, and the South African representative of MRC, refused to be interviewed. There are two great titanium reserves in the whole world. It's a Lucia, Sai Lusa, Singo Hulmente. Sai Lusa, the great tourism, I've come to go to the country now, to go to the principal. It's a Lucia, Sai Lusa, Sai Nigase. It's, it, has been, it has been declared an exclusive area. Environmental management, the community, any begging up, any begging up. That it can be Sabe, a quarter of whom don't be charged poor. Or a full of Pagati community. What are they paying for that resource? Well, the price of an application fee, a thousand rand. Now, for a thousand rand, the minister has chosen to allocate them the rights to an eight billion rand resource on other people's land. It's those people living in that area who are going to bear the cost of mining. But the 8 billion rand and the profit generated from extracting and selling that is going to go to an Australian company. Now, why? Are you going to visit the area? No, no, no not today. Not today? Not today. Have you been there? Yes, I've been there. Have you been there? Yes. No. Isn't this about people's rights on land? Well, that has not come to, to my understanding. My understanding is that it is about uh, competing interests. One uh, group uh, feels that uh, mining should happen. The, the others are, are calling for tourism. I beg to disagree. It involves people's land rights, first and foremost. It involves people's environmental rights. And it involves people's right to, to, to health and peace and tranquility. Those are fundamental human rights that are guaranteed by our constitution. And those rights are being violated by what's happening here on the wild coast. Richard Spoor invited me to join him at a business and human rights conference. And the highlight of that conference was for me to meet Mary Robinson, who has been an enormous inspiration. She quoted this line from Eleanor Roosevelt, which has become a critical focus of my social work intervention. Remember she said that if human rights are to matter at all, they must matter in small places close to home, so small that you cannot find them on any maps of the world. But they are the world of the individual worker in his factory, in his farm, etc. And she said that 
the way in which this would be done would be by concerted citizen action, by people holding their governments accountable. <laughs> The conflict took a bitter turn, which again put South Africa's acclaimed Bill of Rights to the test. Reports emerged of police brutality against Tolo Beni high school students who had refused to participate in festivities to welcome Minister Sanjika. After the conflict with the school principal, uh, the next thing, a police van arrived with three pr policemen, policemen coming yes. in and, and each class was taken successively mm. and the entire class was shambled. Shamba. The boys yeah. were separated from the girls. They, they claimed that they saw it coming because just before the visit by the minister, their normal a practice session, that is football session, was suspended on the basis that they must go and practice uh, songs which are going to be sung in that occasion. And then they asked a question as to how are we going to sing for the minister which our parents are opposed to. Minister Sanjika returned to meet local residents at the Kumkulu almost a year after the historic royal visit. Nobody's going to tell you your job, your job. You are, and you don't tell us our job as well. Nobody knows. The principle is about an uh, environment for sustainable development. And this is really... It's not about people's land rights. It, 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 it's all about that. And it, again, this is about sustainable development. It's about rights. It's about land. It's about all of that. And I want to talk to the company, and I hope you will record this one. It's not about human rights being violated. It's a process of consultation which was not done properly. It's common cause that there has been no decision by this community um, to approve mining on their land. And in, in that respect too, um, the Department of Minerals and Energy is in violation of, of, of law that was enacted for the protection of uh, people who live on communal land. Local residents lodged an appeal with the government and court action was suspended pending the decision. Sarah Sefton of the Legal Resources Centre made an extremely convincing case. The best that Zolko could do was to commit a massive fraud to try to vainly show that they had community support. In August 2009, Sarah Sefton received Zolko's submission, replying to the Crisis Committee's appeal, and sent it to the Crisis Committee to study. Zolko was so desperate that they then went so far as to actually compile a list of some 3,087 local residents who had their ID numbers, their names, 
and critically the signatures, all stating the, effectively the prior free and informed consent to the mining, except it was fraudulent. Life. But they have a question how their names are on the, on the list of supporting because they know, they, they know from their heart they are not supporting the mine, but their names are on the list. But it would take another two years, a change of government, a new Minister of Minerals and a complaint to the public protector before finally, on the 6th of June 2011, Minister Shabangu finally announced her decision with respect to the Tolobeni mining rights. Surprisingly, given the fraudulent submission of names, she found that the consultation process had been adequately done under the circumstances. Zelfs Stacy, met vier vrouwen, wat van heel te mal ander delen van die planeet afkom en met allemaal geaffecteerd is door mijnbouw. En nou hier is om hulle ondersteuning aan die Pondolandse mensen te kom gee. We're fortunate enough today to be joined by four ladies who are members of the International Women in Mining Network. Now what this is, it's an organization that consists of women from all over the world who have somehow been affected by mining and or are interested in mining. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. Seema, why is it that you ladies decided to come to South Africa in particular? We actually came to attend the AVID forum that was held in Cape Town. And uh, we also decided that this would be a good opportunity for our network to link with members, local groups here. Okay. So that's how we got in contact with Nanle and John Clark. Okay. And Banu, what are the challenges that you're facing in your home country that are similar to what you've seen here? Some of the biggest problems are that our governments themselves are uh, not being honest with the communities and not consulting the women, not giving proper information when they are uh, giving license to mining companies when they're selling away the indigenous people's lands and natural resources. Uh, secondly, although we have laws, there is no true uh, consultation happening. The information that is being given to communities and to women is normally false, inaccurate and misleading. And this is not the kind of democratic consultation, consultative process that we would desire. Some people might say the mining is a necessary activity in the economy. I mean, especially when you see people, particularly out in the rural areas, who have no jobs. Mining certainly isn't going to make them at grassroots level wealthy, but certainly having a job, one might argue, is better than not having one at all. Oh, yes, but it all comes back, like back in Papua New Guinea, land is something that we hold so dearly. And when that land is taken away from a person, that, that makes this person even more, um, well, goes into the poverty line, that's how we see it. Mm. And having land sort of gives, you know, the, a status to this person, even if he has a job and has no land. Okay. Yeah. You talk about taking the knowledge back to, to Canada and the experience. What is it that you've learned um, during your trip to South Africa and particularly to this area? I think um, in particular it's very clear that people here um, are, are mobilizing and saying they don't want the mining to go on and I think that's something that is, in, um, is important to hear directly from people and also to get a sense of how people are living off the, like right off the land here, fishing and the kind of farming that people are doing, the kind of cattle herding, and to see, be able to see that um, and then to be able to bring that back. With that area. Three R's, it's remember, revision and restore. And I have a sense that there's this, there's this restoring revival and revisioning process happening. 5050 have been covering the story from the beginning. You can be assured that we will continue to follow Nantle and her community right to the better end. <laughs> Yeah.